Welcome to this soul-lifting broadcast which has been put together for your spiritual growth and to make greatness come on right where you are. Be sure to make the best of this moment as God takes the lead in all that concerns you. Galatians chapter 5, sorry chapter 3, when you read verse 13 and 14, let's start from there. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a, a, a tree. But the blessing, he said that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we, may, we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The Lord bless the reading of his word. So the Bible says here, that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, for it is written, curse is everyone that hung, on, that hung on the tree. When Christ hung on the tree, he paid the price for my redemption and your redemption. He was crucified in the middle of two criminals. One a murderer, the other one a thief. Peter was preaching in the first service and he said he was wondering, uh, what the guys stole for them to crucify him. Maybe an airplane, uh, or maybe uh, in the prayers of killing somebody, I mean, stealing, he also killed, I don't know. But for whatever, they crucified him. So, in the days of Christ, to hang on the cross, it means that you are a terrible criminal who is not worthy of life. And I don't know what anyone here today may have done with your life the past 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or even 70 years. Whatever you may have done with your life that warrants that you are no longer qualified to live. You should be killed. Maybe you have even killed before, which should be the height of it. The Bible says that when Christ hung on the cross, he took the punishment for your misdeeds, what we call sins. So, in your position, he took the repercussion of your sins and he hung on the cross. So, the Bible says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, for it is written, Curse is everyone that hung on the tree. That the blessing of Abraham may come upon the Gentiles. Now, I want to explain this very well so you understand it. And I need you to follow me very carefully. It's the premise for the covenant. And we're going to get into the co covenant of healing and health shortly. But this is the premise. In Deuteronomy 28, God speaking and giving directions to, to Moses. You see there the curse of the law. It said if you will not obey and hearken and adhere to all these sayings, it says curse shall you be in the field, curse shall you be when you go out. He said I will bring upon you plagues and pestilence. Uh, so many things. He said you shall plow on the field and another man will inherit. He, the part of the curse of the law is that somebody will take your wife. It's terrible. All kinds of things. He said, but if you diligently obey and hearken to this commandment, he said, these blessings will run after you and overtake you. He said, you shall be blessed in the house, blessed in the city. You, whatever you lay your hands upon to do shall prosper. You see all the blessings in the Deuteronomy 28. And what the scripture is saying is that there's always a repercussion for disobeying the law. But when Christ hung on the cross, he took that repercussion upon himself. And so today, what is remaining for us is the blessing of Abraham. So, Christ's death did not only pay for my sins and your sins, it grafted us in to the lineage of Abraham. 
So the covenant that God had with Abraham from the beginning, Genesis 15, Genesis 22, that says this covenant will be a perpetual covenant from generation to generation. He said, whoever bless you, or will bless you is blessed. And whoever dares and is stupid enough to curse you, he said, I will curse that person. That promise, that covenant, is what we have now gotten into through Christ. Now, in Romans chapter 5, I'm laying a premise. Romans chapter 5, when you read from verse 17, can you put that on the screen for me? Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. I just want you to understand this uh, very well so that, you know, it will help you as we start to discuss. Bible says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Christ Jesus. Through the one, that one, Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. When he said one man, he was talking about the first man, Adam. When he said, by another man's obedience, was talking about whom the scripture refers to as a second Adam, Jesus. Yeah. Because Christ came to start a new lineage, as it were. By one man's disobedience, sin came into the world. Sin, ladies and gentlemen, primarily is not a verb, it's a noun. It's an entity. Yeah. It was because we were born sinners that we sinned. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. It's not because we sin that we become sinners. The way some people are looking at me like, all right. Can I say that one more time? I said it was because we were born sinners or we have sin as a nature that we sin. God, quote and unquote, is more concerned about the nature before the act. He wants to deal with the nature because that nature is what opens us up for all the bad things to happen. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Yeah. So when we can deal with the nature by coming into Christ, because the Bible says if by one man's disobedience, sin came into the world. By another man's obedience, righteousness be be became a free gift to all. Now it's my choice if I will take hold of the righteousness or not. You know, sometimes you think about it. By one man's disobedience, sin came into the world and it was very great. And it made all men to misbehave. And some people think that one man's obedience, which brought righteousness, then righteousness is weak. So that righteousness now comes upon us and we're still now struggling with sin. No. The righteousness comes... You receive it as a gift. It's a gift with a lift. It lifts you out of poverty, lifts you out of sickness, and lifts you out of a low life. When you come into an understanding of that sin, it will not mess you up. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Because righteousness is the nature of God that we receive in Christ. Just like in Adam, we all died to sin. And we became slaves to sin. And you don't have to teach any one born of a woman to sin. It's just a normal, normal thing. So sin is a noun primarily. It's not a verb. It's the noun that brings the verb. Most of the time we pay attention to the verb, to the detriment of the noun. Is the hold of sin destroyed in your life? Are you now, have you accepted the gift of righteousness? Have you come into the lineage of Abraham? That's the big question. Because if you have, then there's a premise to build on. The understanding that I'm walking in a covenant with God. And by this covenant, this agreement, God will not fail in his own part. I just need to pay attention to my part. And all through the past month, we have discussed the things that trigger the covenant of increase, you know, and all that. And now we want to discuss things that will also trigger the covenant of health, 
of healing and of long life. Are you still with me today? I said, are you still with me today? All right, let's, let's, let's move quickly to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. And um, uh, can you put that up for me from verse 14 or so? I said from verse 14. He said, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Verse 15 says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Verse 16, he says, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Can we read that verse 16 together? I want to go. I will satisfy him. Can we do it one more time? With long life, I will satisfy him. Now, can you pers per personalize it, if you don't mind? One, two, go. With long life, he will satisfy me and show me his salvation. Can you do it one more time? With long life, he will satisfy me and show me his salvation. So if God decides that he wants to satisfy you with long life, it's left to you how you behave around his decision. It's very simple. Somebody invited you to their home for maybe a party, a party and it's buffet. You can decide that you're on a diet and behave like somebody who doesn't want to eat much. <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, and that's the posture that some of us actually pick up when we start to misbehave under the covenant. Because you can be in a covenant and still be misbehaving. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. You enter a place where they say it's all you can eat. You know, something, I mean, we're, we're, most of the time, I mean, we're, we're beginning to have it also in Lagos, but we don't have it much. It's difficult to do all you can eat in Lagos, and you make profit. Praise God. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I remember the story of uh, a young man, my, my, my uncle in Florida was, was <laughs> you know, telling me about a young man that they went to school on scholarship together in the U.S. back in the day, many years ago. And he said, this guy, this Nigerian now old man, because my uncle is now maybe close to 70. He said, this Nigerian, <laughs> said those days they used to ban him from entering some restaurant because they know him. You know all this, all you can eat, Chinese and all that, he will enter. You're supposed to just do lunch. Eat as much as you can, but this guy will hide, he will eat lunch and dinner. <laughs> the Nigerian boy on scholarship, but the guy was hungry and maybe they had not sent his money, you know. This was in the in late 70s, I mean, 70s, you know, said they marked him. They actually <laughs> reported him to the police that they didn't want to see him <laughs> in their restaurant again. It was, was, was a bad case. You know, that's, that's what you get when people over-maximize. You know, some of us have, uh, um, I remember when I was pastoring in the university back in the day, a lady approached me one day and said, Pastor, I need you to pray an agreement prayer with me. I said, for what? He said, my grandma is like one, close to 118, 120 now. And she's, she's becoming an embarrassment to all of us. As in, I mean, 118 years old. And that the wala is too much. We have to bat for her, do, and you know, we can't even communicate with her again. She's, I just want you to agree with me that she will die. <laughs> I looked at her. I said, I'm just starting this career of pastoring. Don't spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> I was an undergraduate, you know, pastor, and I was like, don't spoil this career. I've not heard that somebody prayed before, that somebody would die. Uh, so you will give me time to go and research it. But, but I will pray grace for you to so continue to take care of your grandma because she has been running away from home. You know, she, 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 she didn't want to go home during holidays just because of her grandma. The, man was, the woman was nearing 120. God satisfied her with long life. It became an embarrassment to some people. No, it's just the same way with the, my uncle's friend that I, he, he was, he was oversatisfied with food until they chased him. You know, for somebody here, they, you would tell God, when, maybe when you are 120, God, take me, I'm okay. I am full, satisfied. I've seen my great-grandchildren, and I'm blessed. Let me go. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't miss the opportunity to say amen. Except you don't believe. He said, I will satisfy, satisfy. That means you are full. Full. You are full. You are satisfied. Before Paul died, Paul was saying, you know, 
He said, for me to remain in the flesh, it is to your benefit. For me to be with the Lord, I think I prefer it. Yeah, that's, I mean, somebody who has lived well, lived, finished. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Jacob called his children together. Genesis 49 or so. And he said, come, all of you, all the 12 of you, let me bless you. And I'll tell you how your life will pan out so that you can make adjustment right now. I want you to make adjustment. So he said, he said you, this is what will happen to you, this is what will happen to you, you know. And the Bible says when he had finished blessing and prophesying over them, he wittingly gathered his leg on the bed and he slept. Death is an appointment. The Bible says it has been appointed to man once to die. An appointment is what you keep. And sometimes, if it's not convenient, you change it. <laughs> How you understand what I'm saying? There's no mystery to death. The Bible calls it an appointment. You can change the appointment. You can fix it. To say, Lord, when I'm 105, let's have an appointment. In the physical. So I'll just show up. <laughs> because you are working under the covenant. And this covenant that we're looking at, that we came into through Christ, some people operated it. Abraham operated it. He was the first one to operate it. The Bible says, when you read further in Romans chapter 5, there, it says that this, the covenant, scripture says, is to Abraham and his seed. And it didn't say seed as to many, but as to one. And that seed happened to be Christ. So anyone who will join with Christ comes under the same covenant. It's the same covenant. The same covenant. So if Abraham did not die by accident, you are not permitted to die by accident. Amen. Say better amen if you believe. Amen. If Isaac called Jacob and Esau, or called Esau to say, let me bless you. Because now I know my appointment is get, getting closer. Yeah. And Isaac said, Esau, go and make food for me. Yeah. Go and make food for me. My appointment is close. Let me prophesy over you before I go and release the blessing. So he, he, didn't, he didn't die in ICU. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. He took his appointment. As has been appointed. Glory be to Jesus. I said, glory be to Jesus. So, the covenant of health. Let's, let's, let's start with it, the covenant of health. God wants us to stay healthy and enjoy long life. So, it's to live well, live long. And he has made adequate provision for us under the covenant. Adequate provision. Third John, uh, 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 chapter 1 and verse number 2, Third John 2. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Yeah. I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. It's soul prosperity that, you know, that leads to bodily prosperity. Are you still with me today? Uh, please put up for me Exodus 15 and 26. Exodus 15 and 26. I love, I love that scripture. Exodus 15 and 26. Can I, can I have that on the screen? It said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give heir to his commandment, said, I will, and keep all his status, I will put none of the diseases of Egypt on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Here, God revealed himself himself to the descendant of Abraham the Jews as Jehovah Rapha it's a covenant name for God Jehovah Rapha the Lord our healer one translation says I am the Lord your physician the word Rapha means physician God says I want to be your doctor under this covenant if you will stay under this covenant, I want to be your doctor. It's good to have a doctor. My personal physician is a member of this church. 
but my number one physician is God. Yeah. My doctor, if you're in church, hear me. Yeah. I think she was in the first service, actually. God is the first doctor. The primary doctor. He said, that's what I want to be under the covenant. Under this covenant, I want to be your doctor. I am the Lord, your healer, your physician. Tap your neighbor for me and say, God is my physician. Glory be to God. Now, there are two components to the covenant of health. One is maintaining divine health. And the, the mindset that undergirds that is that I am healthy, created healthy, under the covenant of health, and my assignment is to maintain my health. It's not I am the sick looking for healing. No. So something went wrong, and my health needs to be restored. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Under the covenant, there's a very robust health management scheme package. Yeah, there's the HMO package under the covenant. So that people of God can maintain their health. So there's, there's, there's an aspect for maintaining my health under the covenant. And then the covenant then gets into healing when my health has been tampered with. So let's examine the first one, which is maintaining divine health. Maintaining divine health. In Exodus 23, put that up for me, and verse 25. Exodus 23 and 25. Exodus 23 and 25. Can, can, can I have that up, please? It says, So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and he will take sickness away from the midst of you. In the other scripture we read, it said, I will permit not any of the diseases of Egypt. And Egypt there stands for people who, who, who live without God. Whatever can come on anybody that is outside of the covenant, God said, I will not permit them to come on you. If you will, stay under the covenant and do the right thing. Somebody stay with me today. I said, somebody stay with me today. Then somebody may then be asking the question. So if he says that I will permit not, if he says I will bless your bread and your water and take sickness away from the midst of you, how come Christians still fall sick? Okay, let's, let's, let, let me answer that question. One, I mean, factors that can negatively impact your health, one is unhealthy environment. Unhealthy environment. See, God will not come and help you to clean your house. This is practical teaching. Or, you understand? Yeah. God will not take you away from pathogens, disease-causing you know, agents and all that. God will not take you away from an environment with persistent noise. He wants you to recognize. That's why he gave us a mind to recognize that this is not a good environment for me to be because very soon my head will start to pound. And it's not the devil. It's environmentally induced. If I thought it's the devil, maybe the devil made you sit when you're supposed to leave. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So, uh, persistent noise, dust, you know, intake of contaminated food, Viruses and bacteria. Some people will smell something. Food. It looks like this thing is smelling. It's beginning to smell. But it's still okay. Let, maybe if I microwave it, it, the smell will change. So you quickly microwave it. And you still eat it. And then you think that because you bless it before you eat it. God gave us sense to recognize that this thing is now smelling. And you know that it can cause trouble for you. Know where to release faith and where it is foolishness. Yes, there's a difference between faith, foolishness, and presumption. <laughs> Praise God. So it's very important that we recognize that and take care of our environment. Take care of our environment. Yeah, take care of our environment. One thing that I always celebrate my wife for and I, I, I mean it, this is not one of those pastoral talks where you just want to score a point with your wife. No, not at all. We, 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 we have two lovely girls. Uh, um, my, my, my first daughter is now, is going to be 12 this year. 
and the other one, 10. When they were small, my wife insisted that our environment be extremely clean. Anything that the kids will use must be extreme. To the point, sometimes I was almost, you know, irritated about how finicky she was with the things that I had to do with them. Yeah. It will surprise you that as seemingly, you know, all together as I am, I can be a bit scattered when I'm in my element, you know. Yeah. So I'm just confessing to you, you know, so you understand. So she had had to cope with me in my element. And, um, but I, I really appreciate the fact, I mean, I say this to the glory of God, for by grace and by every precaution that God blessed. None of our daughters, you know, were admitted, I mean, was admitted in the hospital, you know, in those early days, growing up for anything, any disease. And you see, I recognize that God's grace and God's blessings was part of it. Maybe God just kept me from distractions. But this woman took precaution. I'm just telling you. Yeah. So, so you, 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 you understand that when you do what is right with the environment, you will not nullify the effect of the covenant. Sometimes God is ashamed of some people under the covenant. I'm protecting you and see what you are doing to yourself. Yeah. Some other times, sicknesses come because of direct attack of the devil. And I recognize that. Yeah. Direct attack of the devil. Jesus looked at a woman, the woman that was bent over backward. I don't even know. Was it like this or like that? And the Bible says when this woman approached Jesus, Jesus said something to her. I mean, to the people who came to say, why did you heal her on Sabbath day? He said, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, somebody who's supposed to be under the covenant, who has been bound these 18 years, be set loose from my infirmities? Then Jesus said, woman, thou art loose from your infirmities. It meant that that woman, because Jesus said, being a daughter of Abraham, she was under the covenant, but the devil attacked her. So some sicknesses come, by the attack of the devil. But not all sicknesses come from the devil or as indirectly by attack. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not all. Third, third one is psychosomatic illnesses. Psychosomatic illnesses. It works on the premise that whatever the mind cannot undo, it passes to the body. If you overload your mind, keeping things to yourself, and going with, you know, Christian lingos, Christianese, it is well, it is well. You are dying inside and you are saying it is well. You understand? That's what we do. Am I saying the truth? Whatever the mind cannot handle, it passes to the body. So somebody who has been saying it is well, it is well, and you are you're keeping hurt, malice, bitterness, unforgiveness, and loading everything up, before you know it, whatever the mind cannot handle, it transfers to the body. Such people are the people that they will go to the hospital, the doctor will test them, and they will say they can't find anything. There was a, um, a brother, he used to be my friend, he said, my friend, uh, um, God has blessed him so much now, he's, uh, I mean, it's a big guy around town. Back in the day, his businesses were upside down, his life was miserable. He was driving one pickup like this on the Korodu Road one day. Then he was doing waste disposal collecting waste from people from house to house. And he said one point he was on the expressway and the road was turning upside down as he was driving. He almost had an accident. He had to park immediately. Run, ran out of the car. You understand? When road starts to shift as you are driving, <laughs> he parked the vehicle, ran out of the car, went to look for somewhere to lie down. He had too many things on his mind. The mind could not handle it. It transferred to his eyes. <laughs> I don't know if you get what I'm saying. He was hoeing. He had deadlines. You know, even the vehicle was driving. They pushed it to start that money. You know all those kind of things. His mind could no longer handle it. transferred to his eyes. He was seeing double. When he got to the hospital, they checked him. They said they couldn't find anything. <laughs> In the course of the month, we were hoping... Uh, in one of our midweek events on Wednesdays to bring someone to talk to us about how 
we can maintain, you know, emotional health. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that. We'll bring a professional to do that in the course of this month. But I want you to understand there are psychosomatic illnesses that is not caused by any uh, disease causing agents or anything. It's just you are, not, you are mismanaging your mind. You know, panic attack that can lead to depression. You are constantly in fear. Stress is too much and you are not managing the stress. You are under the covenant, but your body will revolt. It will revolt after a while. Your mind is taking in too much. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor, and a heavy lady, and I will give you rest. And you are behaving like, as if you are the one that killed Jesus. As if all the problems of Lagos State and Nigeria, they are all together on your head. Yeah. I know you want the business to grow, and you want the promotion. But by the arm of flesh, no man shall prevail. Yeah, Jesus already died. Don't die for promotion. <laughs> yeah. And somebody may be listening to me here. Your own may not be business or work. It may be the relationship. The same way Christ died so that you can have peace in your home. So you need to sit tight and tell yourself, Jesus will work this home out and I will not run mad. Yes. It may look like it right now, every time we talk, we don't even understand ourselves. Somebody's speaking Spanish, somebody's speaking French, and we're almost headbutting ourselves, always slapping ourselves. But if you only calm down and engage the rest that comes from Jesus, and tell yourself, in my rest and quietness, this home will start to run smoothly. It's not by all this plenty fight, argument, crying all day, all night. Now you are forgetting things. They give you a project to do. You can't remember when to start, when to you be finished. Just because you say there's a marital problem. You are not the only one that is having a wrong time, I mean a rough time in marriage. Virtually all marriages go through a rough time. Yeah. I mean, after, I, mean I, I don't know. I'm not the kind of pastor that tell you, you know, uh, never had, we don't, we've never had issues. I once asked myself, why did I marry this woman? Why? God, did you send me? And then God was reminding me, but I told you to marry her. So relax, I'm going to resolve it. Yeah, but you get to that point, you ask yourself, who sent me? In fact, in anything, in most things in life, if you have never asked yourself that question, who sent me, you can't engage the help of God. That's the truth. Because when you ask yourself, who sent me, God will tell you, I sent you. And sit there, sit there. Sit down there. <laughs> glory to Jesus. I said glory to Jesus. Extremely important. Sometimes it's just simple ignorance that will, you know, that the devil we, we use to steal our health. Ignorance, carelessness, unhealthy lifestyle, make poor choices. Yeah, it's unhealthy lifestyle. It's not literally like that, but when you smoke with bread, you know, it's the same thing. <laughs> when you are eating bread and you are using smoke to wash it down. Yeah. So, ex I mean, smoking, drinking. He said, I mean, alcohol is, is doing something to, to your system, damaging something there, and you insist I'm going to take it, and Jesus will be looking at you, take it. But we'll meet in front. Yeah. Glory be to Jesus. And the last one there is uh, disobedience, which we call sin. He that breaks the head, the serpent will bite. Ecclesiastes 10, 8. So when you allow the devourer, you are consistently working in unforgiveness, like I said before, and not caring whatever God thinks about it. What you are saying is that I don't mind what happens to my health, though I'm under the covenant. Glory be to Jesus. I said glory be to Jesus. Lastly today, when health has been tampered with, because of many of these, not because God is not faithful, but because of many of these things that I've mentioned. When health has been tampered with, God still makes a provision for my healing and your healing. Yeah. God still makes a provision for my healing and your healing. So there's a recovery path in God. God has ensured that believers have unrestricted access, unrestricted access to divine healing. Anytime there's a need to restore health. That's God's provision for us. So we can go all the way, do all sorts of funny things, yet God says, I will still heal you. 
I will still. So if there's anyone here listening to me today, I don't care whatever the, the, the doctors said you have, whether it's HIV, syphilis, any sexually transmitted disease, and you know that you misbehave. But God said, I'm a God of mercy. Yeah. Some people think, I have to live with this because I was the one that, you know, sinned and it came upon me. No. You're still my child. That's what God is saying to you. Listen to me this, this morning. Listen to me. God still wants to heal you. That's the good news. He still wants to heal you. He, he doesn't forsake his own. He forgives and then he heals. The psalmist David said, he, he forgives all my iniquities. He heals all of my diseases. If I don't tell someone sin can talk like that, based on the understanding of the covenant of Abraham, what about you? That's an Old Testament saying, David. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not all of his benefits. He forgives all my iniquities and he heals all my diseases. Then you are sitting in one corner saying, this thing came upon me because I sinned. God said, I will forgive your sins and heal you. All your diseases. Say amen, who believe? So it's important that we focus our attention on that. Next Sunday, I'm going to be talking about how God heals us supernaturally, different ways that healing comes from. But it suffices to say today that Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, the Bible says, Surely he has borne our grief and carried all, I mean, carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Glory be to Jesus. By his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. Jesus called healing children's bread. He said healing is children's bread. God just gives us bread, like bread, staple food. We can get healing at any time. Any time. That's supernatural healing. Supernatural healing. And some people also talk about, I mean, uh, um, ask questions about medical interventions. In fact, there are some denominations where Christians don't want to embrace any kind of medical intervention. I'm not speaking to that directly, but I'm saying that here, I don't know what goes on anywhere else, but in this house, what we believe is that medical interventions also come from God. Deuteronomy 29 and verse number 29. The Bible says that the secret things belong to God and the things that are revealed belong to us and our children. Can you put that up for me so that it doesn't look like I formed it? Deuteronomy 29 and verse number 29. Somebody help me preach today. You've done a good job so far. Don't spoil it at this point. <laughs> Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29. It says the secret things belong to God, to the Lord, our God, but the things... The things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may do all the works of this law. Science comes under revealed knowledge. The things that are revealed. And God, in every generation, will release. That's why there are certain diseases that are in the 60s and 70s, they had no cure. And then gradually, in, in Dispensations will come. God will reveal. God will reveal. Are you still with me today? There are things that used to kill people anyhow before now. But that today, we found the solutions to them. The secret things belong to God. The things that are revealed belong to us and our children. Let me give you another one. Ezekiel 47 and verse number 12. Ezekiel 47 and verse number 12. It says, along the bank of the river, on the side, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary says the fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. So this scripture attests to the fact that plants can give 
healing. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So, but this is the caveat. As a round off, this is the caveat. The caveat is this. God wants you to accept him as your healer. All medical breakthroughs come from God. He is the omniscient God, all-knowing. And in research, we we'll get into his mind. We understand how something works. We call it a scientific breakthrough. That's what we call it. That's where science and God meet. When God reveals something to us, and we call it a breakthrough. Yeah. As a believer, God can heal you directly with a word. I'm going to pray this afternoon. God will heal in this place. But much more than that, I'm saying that God, I mean, medical interventions are not from the devil, but from God. But this is the caveat. This is where I, where I wrap it up. Talking about David, for instance, David killed Goliath, and everybody knows David for killing Goliath. But before David killed Goliath, David, David killed the lion and the bear. There's a progression to the growth of our faith in God. When you, all you focus on for healing is medical intervention, you will not have the capacity to develop your faith in God for healing. So you feel small headache, you pop a, a painkiller, and that's it. And you get used to that. When is the day that you're going to lay hands on that head and say, headache, I command you, go now in the name of Jesus. And give yourself some time and see relief come upon that head and see that God has healed you. So that from there you can, you can, you can then graduate to backache, to boil. You will speak to boy and it will disappear by tomorrow morning. And you will know that God, there's power on your tongue. I hope you understand what I'm saying. But if all you think about all the time, hey, let me call my doctor. Doctor, see what I've just seen. No? My doctor, ah, it is eschromatis eschromata. <laughs> and the moment the doctor says, this is what is it, you just believe it. Some people here will believe the doctor more than God. And that's our problem. God already written in his word. See, the, the danger with medical science, part of it is the way it is practiced. Doctors have to say the fact. The fact is not always the truth. There are two different things. What is written is more important than what is happening. Oh, you'll get that when you get home. I say what is written is more important than what is happening. Doctors tell you what is happening. God has written something concerning you. And what is written is stronger because it has the power to change what is happening. So, so the problem generally is if you, all you focus on is medical science, you, you tend to live only by medical terminologies and all the things they're telling you and you don't live by the word of God. Yeah. You don't live by the word. You don't give opportunity for your faith to grow and develop. I believe some people just wanted to help people to develop their faith. That's why they say don't take drug at all in some churches. They just say don't take drug at all. The truth is that some people have died because of it. Yes. Because their faith could not bring their healing. And pastor said, don't take drug at all. So there's no reason to use any blanket thing. What we should do is to encourage ourselves to release our faith in God and not to see science or medical science as being against God's word. No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Every knowledge is from Jehovah God. Anything that we're doing on the face of the heart today, God released the knowledge to us. Is a custodian of all knowledge. It's custodian of everything. Glory be to Jesus. I said, glory be to Jesus. So the next time you stand before a doctor, I don't know the kind of relationship you have with your doctor, but if you are like me, I have my doctor is my sheep, and my sheep hear my voice. <laughs> so I tell the doctor. Uh, whatever you want to tell me, know that I already knew from the word that I am healed. So uh, you can see what is happening. Both of us will pray over it right now, and that's the end of it. <laughs> Praise God. And we'll move from there to restoration of health. Simple. 
I hope you understand what I'm saying. This one that you are leaving your doctor's office is like a sentence to death. You know? But when your doctor calls on the phone and say, I'm sorry, it is not good. It's not good news. Don't say it. Because I already have good news in the world. Whatever it is, I'm already healed. Yeah. And then your journey of healing starts from that point. Thank you for listening. We hope you are truly blessed. Please feel free to email us at info at elevationng.org for all inquiries or to share any testimonies. You can also follow us on our social media channels at ElevationNG to have access to real-time updates on all broadcasts and special programs. Till we come your way again, keep making greatness common.